all the other organizers. It's an amazing place, and I think uh, the talks have been very stimulating, so thanks a lot for that. Uh, also, thank you, everyone, for sticking around until this late. Uh, hopefully, it will pay off, and you'll, you'll get something out of the talk. Uh, so I come from University of Warwick, where we uh, have heavily invested in synthetic biology, and we're also sort of having a set of groups working on trying to engineer ecosystems. And if I have time, uh, I'll try to talk about that at the end. Uh, but the primarily, uh, I'll focus on the theme of the, uh, of the workshop and talk about how we're trying to understand uh, microbial communities. So people have been showing <coughs> rather, <coughs> excuse me, rather uh, static pictures of microbial communities except for the beautiful talk on the zebrafish gut where we really seen how, how dynamic these systems can be. And this is just a sort of a tiny example from uh, my lab where we have this system which is a freshwater sample that's been stable in the lab for over a year now uh, and it seems to respond to light. It has uh, cyanobacteria in there and a bunch of other microbes. Uh, and we don't, we don't understand anything about this system. We're not uh, putting manpower on the system yet, but this is something that keeps me going. I think these systems are fascinating, the way how they can be stable and, and, and complex at the same time, uh, and dynamically complex. So this is what we are interested in, understanding these kinds of systems. And obviously, there is, this is not just about the basic science. There is a lot of relevance, as we've been hearing, uh, for human health, uh, but also in terms of biotechnology. So a lot of water remediation uh, facilities are actively using microbes, microbial communities, but also there are other processes, uh, including uh, agriculture, where microbes play key roles. Microbial communities play key roles. Uh, in terms of the scientific questions, we've been hearing, uh, hearing them already over the week, and I'm not going to repeat them, but obviously we are also very much uh, interested in these uh, questions. And a few years ago, we organized a workshop very much like this, uh, and there was a position paper coming out of that with, with around 50 authors on it, uh, where we tried to summarize some of these open questions. And, and, and the questions are closing quickly with the beautiful work we've been hearing. Uh, what I'm going to introduce you today is uh, a system that we've been spending a lot of time with, uh, which is so-called anaerobic digestion systems. And the nice thing about these systems is that uh, you can talk about a community-level function, because uh, the way they operate is they simply digest an, uh, organic matter uh, all the way down <coughs> to methane. And <coughs> this is actually... Uh, a very much used biotechnology uh, actually around the world uh, and, and heavily used in places like Germany, China, and India, uh, where people will build these huge reactors, uh, shovel in organic matter, you know, food waste, agricultural waste, etc., and the microbial community within these reactors will then degrade that organic waste and produce methane as an end product, which you can then use as energy source, obviously. Uh, so that's the biotechnology side of it. The anaerobic digestion process itself obviously occurs uh, wherever you have uh, depletion of uh, oxygen, and that could be much more common. And obviously, uh, most of the marine sediments uh, would count as anaerobic digestion systems, but also several microenvironments which are oxygen depleted uh, could show uh, it's called act as an aerobic digestion system. So here I have a few examples uh, where people have measured, for example, uh, the oxygen levels in a biofilm uh, where oxygen is very quickly depleted uh, below the surface for, of the biofilm. Uh, in the gut, I, I couldn't find much information, but at least in some cases there seems to be oxygen depletion. And I mentioned the marine sediments uh, where obviously oxygen can be depleted. And it's not just about oxygen, but other strong electron acceptors, in particular sulfate, nitrate, which a lot of microbes can use, uh, can also get depleted. So these are very nice studies from 80s and 90s where people have measured these electron acceptor profiles in, in marine sediments. And as you can see, uh, for example, sulfate in this case can quickly get depleted. And uh, this gives rise to uh, uh, different, uh, different processes. So the other aspect of anaerobic digestion, 
uh, should come back to this slide, is that it is relatively well understood, at least at a course level. So as I mentioned, the organic, uh, complex organics come into system, and usually it's believed that they are degraded first by primary degraders uh, into less complex sugars, which can then get uh, fed on by uh, so-called secondary fermenters, uh, which will then ultimately lead into formation of these organic acids, which can now, at the final stage, be degraded by methanogens and, and, and other, uh, uh, other organisms like uh, 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 acetoclastic bacteria. But uh, the, in a sense, the understanding is that this system acts as a food ladder uh, where we go from complex sugars toward much simpler sugars. And each of the step is uh, obviously a redox reaction, and therefore the presence of terminal electron acceptors is quite crucial for the functioning of this system. In particular, uh, we know that these final stages of uh, degradation of simpler sugars uh, can quickly get uh, limited by, by the availability of terminal electron acceptors. I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about that as we, as we go, go on. So we are, we are interested in understanding the communities in these systems, how they work, how they function, and our approach has been uh, sort of uh, this taking the two ends that we've been hearing, the top-down and bottom-up approaches. At the, what we mean by that is on the top-down side, we try to look at the natural communities that exist in these anaerobic digestion systems. They usually contain hundreds to thousands of species, so we're talking about complex systems, and we try to use different approaches to study those at that level. And on the other hand, we had this naive idea of can we create such systems from bottom up with very few number of species, maybe up to five species, that can still achieve that community function, and how would those systems look like? Uh, so we, we, got, we got very lucky convincing the funders that this was an interesting thing to do, and uh, I'm leading this rather big project involving multiple institutions, and I'll tell you a bit uh, about that. But also we uh, started the sister project that I want to tell you first about, uh, which we are quite excited about, actually. Uh, so the idea here was that we can use these functional systems and uh, study them over time using metagenomics. Okay, so as I said, this is a biotechnological application, so there are a bunch of facilities across Europe, also in the UK, where people do anaerobic digestion in these big reactors. So the, the thought was that uh, we can sample these reactors over time, and actually the project scope at the moment is for a year, but we're trying to extend it, and the sampling we're doing is uh, over every week. So I think this is going to be the first of its kind in terms of uh, having temporal metagenomics data from a system where we can also claim to have a function. Uh, and, and the function is important because uh, we can also collect uh, functional metadata from these reactors, in particular pH, uh, temperature, uh, sometimes the feed that goes in, the composition of that feed, and obviously the methane production. Right? So we can then also go back to the metadata and, uh, and ask questions around how the metagenomics uh, fits with the metadata and so on. Uh, this project started about three months ago, so we don't have much results yet. I'll just give you a taste of what we're gonna try and do in this system and what kind of things we can learn. Uh, and obviously the sequencing is being done in, in batches, so we don't get the data as we go along, but rather we have to wait a bit. So uh, j just to give you a sense of what is going on, these reactors seem to be uh, quite different in general. Uh, obviously, they are being fed with different things, uh, some of them with urban waste, some of them with agricultural waste. Uh, some of them are at the same site, hence they are getting the same food. And it seems that this is reflected in their microbiomes, right? Uh, so these three, for example, are at the same site, and they are getting fed by the same things, and they are pretty similar, uh, at least in this family level. This is 16S data I'm showing you. You can also uh, reduce the dimensionality of this data and uh, create these uh, PCA plots, and uh, this is how, how the different reactors look like. We just plugged in some gut samples in there uh, from a human gut uh, microbiome project, and they seem quite different uh, from, from those. But the bottom line is that the reactors are different, uh, they, they are fed differently, and it seems that they're uh, microbiomes are also different. So these 16S plots are, 
useful to a certain extent. What we're more interested in is the functions. So we've been working also on developing bioinformatics platforms to go from the 16S data uh, to metabolic profiles, and uh, Andrea is in the, in the room, so she's helping with this aspect where we try to then go from the 16S to genomes to, um, to, to metabolic pathways, and we try to understand whether there are sort of differences in metabolic capabilities of the different reactors, and there seems uh, that, th that there is something going on, and we don't yet know whether this then relates to the feed composition uh, and so on. So that's, that's what we're trying to understand. So in the meantime, uh, we've been also trying to get some of these uh, microbiomes into the lab and study them in the lab as complex communities. And this is mostly work in, this, in the context of this pr big project I mentioned, led by Angus Buckling at University of Exeter. And what he's been doing is to set up uh, lab-scale reactors, these tiny 500 mil uh, 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 bottles, anaerobic bottles, and grow these uh, microbiomes in these, uh, in these bottles using a synthetic feed. And uh, he's done that using, again, microbiomes from different reactors, but pairing them up with slurry from these bioreactors uh, or the, the slurry that is used to set up these bioreactors originally. So the idea was whether there was some sort of optimization going on in the reactors that they somehow are adapted better uh, to the anaerobic digestion. And it seems to be the case. So the dark uh, data points here are from the reactors, and the open ones are from paired uh, slurries. In most cases, the slurry was what originally the reactors were uh, inoculated with. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, these systems are open, so it's not uh, that simple, but we, we thought that maybe that's a sort of a pair, loose pairing where we have the original source versus what has been in the reactor for a long time. And uh, so this is over time in the lab uh, as these communities get adapted or get fed with the synthetic media, and they seem to converge. Uh, and we can, we can also see that actually in their 16S profiles. Uh, so again here, the the, the squares and the circles are the reactors or the slurry, and they seem to all converge to, uh, to, to a certain point in, 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 in the compositional space as you adapt them. Uh, and then, you know, what, what this simply shows is that the, the communities can be different, and over time they can adapt to a certain feed, uh, but also uh, because we have this sort of uh, function in our hand, which is the methane production, we thought we can do fun things with it. And one of the fun things that Angus tried is to try to combine uh, communities that have different performances, right? So as I was showing here earlier, uh, there are uh, different communities that perform differently in terms of methane production. And you can now say, what happens if I mix, mix a poor performer and a good performer? What's going to be the methane production? What's going to be the composition? And it turns out that uh, this is the poor performer, and the dark here is a good performer in terms of methane production, and the mixture seems to overline with the, with the good performer over time as you, as you keep them. And, and what was interesting uh, to us is that uh, as this is happening in the, in the sort of performance, in the 16S uh, or the compositional space, uh, the, the mixture was converging towards the better performer. So it seems that somehow, um, the better performing community is taking over as a community. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a rather uh, sort of preliminary result. We, we try to still understand what is going on here, but Angus has been doing more experiments around this where they uh, coalesce or mix different numbers of communities, and it seems that always the best performing community uh, or the mixture always converges to the best performing community. So I don't want to sort of make much out of this because we don't really understand what is going on, but I guess one bottom line that we can take from this is that the microbial interactions within the community, in these natural communities, seem to matter and, and seem to sort of give them uh, a, a sort of a com real sense of community, right? So that it seems that functionally speaking, there is something that we can say is a community, and this community can go through perturbations as a single unit. Say again? Uh, 
Well, no, I mean, the, the, what, I'm, what I mean is they stick together in the sense of that as you mix them and as you grow them over time, uh, then the mixture behaves as in the, uh, as, as the better performing community. So they are not clumped or anything. They, these are mixed environments once we have them in, the, in these lab reactors. Okay, so but it suggests that the, the, the interactions in the community somehow allow the, the better performing community to dominate the system is, is what we are thinking. So then what drives those interactions? Uh, it, it becomes the question, right? So what is really happening in these communities? And I guess many of us are interested in this question uh, as well as the diversity in these communities, how, how it is maintained. And uh, I'll just take a sort of a side shot at uh, uh, Johnny Depp here as he stars in uh, Don Juan de Marco. He, there is one scene where he sets up all these philosophical questions and then he says the answer to all of these questions, meaning of life, what we are we doing here, etc. He says it's one on the, the same and it's love. Uh, in our case, I think uh, the answer is metabolism. Uh, and I, hopefully most, most of you will agree with that. With that. Uh, obviously, there, is, there are you know, we've been hearing about toxins and uh, bacteria killing each other, uh, other things, but I think a lot of the interactions are driven by uh, metabolic, uh, metabolic processes, and therefore we need to understand this, right? And the cellular metabolism in the microbial case uh, is already quite complicated, so we're talking about thousands of reactions, and we have these textbook pictures where Everything is neat and ordered and pathways, everything has a function and a role. Uh, but as we've been hearing, this is more like, I, I increasingly started to think about this as like a sponge that you, know, you squeeze and it, everything comes from all sides. And that's actually a paradoxical thing, right? Why, why would metabolism re result in so much excretion is not an obvious thing, right? Every cell needs all those metabolic elements, so why should they be secreting uh, metabolites out, but as we've been hearing, uh, they do so, and all those excreted metabolites give rise to these different metabolic interactions, like cross-feeding, uh, syntrophy, oxytrophy, uh, and also, in some cases, metabolic cycles. So why are these things happening? Uh, and they are happening because metabolism behaves in a certain way, and obviously metabolism is the result of evolution, so we are now facing an evolutionary question why did metabolism evolve in such a way that we have all these metabolic interactions? So this is something we've been thinking a lot about. Uh, and obviously, the evolution is not simply an optimization process, as we know. It's rather like you're trying to swim in the sea, and the environment changes as you do things and as you adapt to the environment. And that's the thought that we've been playing with to try to understand uh, cellular metabolism and, and emergence of interactions. So one of the things that we early on looked at is uh, the possible evolution, the possible ways of how cross-feeding can evolve. And people have been thinking about this problem quite a while. And one of the ideas is that constraints within cellular metabolism, both in terms of adaptation to different sugar sources, but also limitations in terms of enzyme production or respiration rates, can lead to uh, evolution of cross-feeding. And we wanted to test that idea uh, using FPA models, and we heard a lot about FPA, but if I may quickly introduce, this is actually a linear optimization uh, approach where you uh, set certain constraints on uh, metabolism, which is set out as uh, stoichiometric uh, reaction sets, and then assuming steady state, and given those constraints, you optimize the system for fluxes. And obviously, it's been used a lot. We, tried to put a twist on it by trying to uh, use FBA to model multi-species systems as well as evolution. So the idea here is that uh, instead of running a single FBA, I run multiple FBAs in a shared environment using what is known as dynamic FBA. So we run the stoichiometric linear optimizations for each model, uh, uh, for each of these models, and then we run a differential equation model to simulate the environment. So the models uptake certain metabolites, and they perhaps excrete something or not. So we then update the environment, and then we go back and update the models. And uh, I think people have been talking about this, so this is the same approach used in Comet. Uh, the twist we added is that 
uh, for each model, uh, we, cons we added a sort of a global constraint where we say the total uptake and excretion uh, fluxes on a model are, are constrained, right? So you have a certain amount. This could be due to enzymatic constraints or other cellular constraints, uh, but it's a sort of an abstract notion that we put in. And you can now, given that constraint on total uptakes, you can distribute it across different uptake processes uh, as you wish, so that's actually optimized by the model. But the only way you can change these investments into the different substrates uh, is through mutation. So that's how we introduce then evolution. So this is just a sort of abstract way we can model uh, now a multi-species system in the same environment uh, along with evolution. So we have both ecology and evolution potentially. So we wanted to try if this model makes any, any sense, if it does anything, any, any sensible predictions. So we, we wanted to try it on a well-studied case and we told the Lansky experiment where they took the E. coli um, uh, through batch transfers uh, over many years. As an example, uh, we can study because in some lineages of this experiment, they find actually uh, multiple uh, sort of genotypes arising. Uh, and we thought perhaps we can, we can sort of simulate the system. And, and obviously you can, so you can set up an E. coli model and you can set up this experiment in the context of this model. So the, the way this looks like is that uh, you start with a single model. So each of these lines is a model now. The x-axis is just our subculturing, just like in the Lansky experiment. And then uh, each model grows based on its uh, uh, sort of biomass flux, flux. And then this is the population size associated with each model. And the models, as they grow, they give rise to mutants. So some mutants arise and then they get lost again because we do this subculturing. And some, uh, some mutants persist and they stick around. As you see, we get a bunch of different genotypes uh, surviving at the end. Uh, this is all published work, so I'm just going through it very quickly. But the bottom line is that we, we, we end up with two types of models evolving in these simulations. So we start with a original E. coli model set up in a certain way. And what, what happens is that this model evolves its glucose uptake rate, but as it does so, uh, its optimal state becomes one in which it excretes acetate. And that acetate excretion, uh, if you wish, creates another niche, if you want to think about it like that, uh, into which another uh, genotype can evolve, which adjusts its uptake rate such that it, it, it prefers acetate over glucose. So it's, it's quite abstract, and I think some of the elements of this model uh, or of this result arise because, directly because we set the model in a certain way, assuming a very strong trade-off between different uh, aspects of the substrate uh, uptake. Uh, but still, we think it is useful. It seems to uh, explain some aspects of the system in the Lansky experiment. So we, teamed up with Dominic Schneider, who then went back to the clones uh, in that one lineage where they find these different lineages and looked at their growth on acetate and glucose. Uh, and we find that uh, it seems that one genotype has improved on uh, acetate and didn't change much on glucose, whereas the other one has increased on glucose and, and sort of went down on acetate growth. So as I said, uh, I'm happy to talk to you more about this. this. This model is available to download if you're interested, and we're talking about trying to link it up with comets and, and so on. But what I want to move on is this idea that uh, you know, constraints uh, in your cellular system, either due to enzyme production or perhaps rates of respiration, can shift this metabolism towards uh, fermentation, and these products can get secreted and act as basically points of interaction with other bacteria. And this is, uh, as I said, quite common, uh, especially when, uh, not, not just because of cellular constraint, but especially when uh, respiratory pathways stop simply because there is no terminal electron acceptors available, right? So the respiratory pathway is, is the part where you dump electrons on, on a terminal electron acceptor, Usually this is oxygen, but not necessarily always, so you can use sulfate, nitrate. But if none of those things are available, you can't do this anymore. The only way you can get rid of electrons is, is through fermentation. And this is very common in anaerobic digestion, as I was saying. So uh, to start with, there is no oxygen. 
Uh, so many bugs will use nitrate or sulfate, but those things get depleted as well. So you end up with a situation where the only thing you can do is ferment, okay? Uh, and this is, and these fermentation products will be taken up by other bacteria uh, in a process called syntrophy, which is very similar to cross-feeding with a twist, because people will usually assume that there is an inhibition here, which I'll tell you more about in a bit. So the key thing here to note and start to think about is that these fermentative pathways, they're low energy pathways, okay? If you're respiring, if you're us and if you're eating glucose and respiring with oxygen, we are talking about around 2,000 kilojoules of energy uh, per mole, whereas if you're doing respiration, uh, respiration on more weaker electron acceptors, this energy goes down. And if you're thinking about uh, fermentation, this energy goes even down further, okay? So we thought about, you know, what will be the broader consequences of this? Because this is something that people usually don't think about. People think about E. coli, oxygen, glucose. And uh, if you think about this, the, the, the low energy what, or the energy that is close to zero, what it means is that we are closer to a thermodynamic equilibrium, right? As the bacteria converts some substrate into products, it is actually running this reaction, the chemical reaction towards equilibrium. And if you start very far from equilibrium, you'll probably never reach it. But if you're starting very close to it, uh, you might actually reach it, right? So then the sort of thermodynamic uh, aspect, the reaction free energy becomes an important factor perhaps. And usually people have just considered substrate uptake kinetics. You don't worry about products um, because you're in a high energy regime. Uh, but there are times that where you should consider this uh, thermodynamics, and people have been trying to put thermodynamics in microbial growth models. Now, we started to think about the impact of this on diversity, right? So, and we, we already talked about exclusion principle. So, the general view on diversity is that, uh, you know, if you apply a kinetic growth model, and if you have a single substrate, you cannot maintain two species on that substrate uh, with that simple uh, growth model. Obviously, you can if you have inhibitory interactions, if, you, if these guys are secreting different things that kill each other, et cetera, et cetera. But if you just go with the simplest model of there's one substrate and two species feeding on that substrate, uh, you cannot maintain these guys. Uh, one of them with the better substrate uptake rate will win that competition and will dominate, for example, the chemostat. This is, a, this is just showing a chemostat model here. Uh, so that's fine, I don't have to go into details of that. We thought, what would happen here if we now have a thermodynamical uh, view of, of the world? So in particular, if we now adjust this uh, growth model with a thermodynamic factor, uh, what this factor does is basically it brings in the product concentration into the equation, right? So and now uh, you can create situations where actually you can grow on the same substrate, uh, but both species can coexist. Now, the key thing for this to work is that the two species should consume uh, the substrate in different ways, so they should have different byproducts. Otherwise, their energetics would have been the same as well, so they would have been the same species. Uh, but if that is satisfied, and also if those two reactions were really close to equilibrium, um, then this thing will work, right? So we have to be really close to thermodynamic equilibrium such that the fast guy, even though it's fast in uptake, it actually reaches equilibrium and it cannot grow anymore. That leaves still some substrate for the other bug to grow. So this is a, an interesting concept, we thought, because theoretically, uh, I can now play this game and I can set up as many reactions as I want and as many species as I want, as long as I'm in this very thermodynamically inhibited regime, I can have as many species as I want. So this sort of uh, creates an answer to the diversity issue, uh, but obviously only in this very uh, highly compromised thermodynamic regime. And uh, actually the regime where this works is around uh, minus 100 kilojoules. So as soon as, because these, the way this equation is set up, uh, because it is sort of exponential, uh, you have basically a cliff there, and as soon as the thermodynamics uh, are above a certain threshold, the kinetic term dominates and the diversity is lost.
Uh, but it turns out that actually this, uh, this sort of regime uh, we're talking about applies in the case of many fermentation reactions. So many fermentation reactions have uh, standard uh, Gibbs free energies around minus 100 or below. Uh, hence, we think that this, this theory could actually be relevant, for, especially for anaerobic digestion systems. Okay, so this is just summarizing what I've been saying. So cellular constraints can give rise to metabolic overflows, which can then give rise to cross-feeding uh, at one hand, and at the other hand, depletion of strong terminal electron acceptors will shift you to a thermodynamically compromised regime where actually diversity wouldn't be uh, such an issue anymore because there wouldn't be much competition going on anymore. So how, how relevant are these things really? Uh, I think they're very relevant in the case of anaerobic digestion. So it's well known, as I was saying, that the anaerobic digestion systems work like a food letter, and you reach a point where uh, you're basically having to ferment these compounds like lactate, acetate, which, are, which don't have much energy. Okay? And the other aspect is that the electron acceptors are being depleted by all these people above you so that when you come down here, you potentially don't have electron acceptors either. So one of the key interactions that's known as syntrophy is actually based on this thermodynamics. So you have so-called sulfate reducers, and this is why people are interested in sulfate. So they will normally respire sulfate, but when sulfate runs out, uh, they have to ferment. And they usually live on small organic acids like lactate uh, and similar compounds. And when they ferment, they ferment lactate into acetate and hydrogen. That reaction will reach thermodynamic equilibrium. The only way this guy can continue growing is by lowering the product uh, concentration, in this case, hydrogen and acetate. And that's done by methanogens, uh, who are sort of specialized on these, uh, so who are among the few species that can uh, eat hydrogen and acetate. Hence, you have, this you have to have this interaction, otherwise nobody can grow. So this is known as syntrophy, and this is just giving you the delta Gs associated with that. So we want to sort of study this system to better understand uh, how that system evolves, because it's also interesting that whenever there is sulfate, this interaction will go away, right? Uh, so there's this ecological component, there's the thermodynamics stuff that we like. So we said, let's put this system together, and it's actually a system that David Stahl at UWASH uh, has been studying a lot, so uh, they helped us also a lot when we were first getting set up. Uh, we just tried to set up a co-culture, and we failed miserably at this at the beginning, and then finally we run a huge experiment with uh, a large number of co-cultures, we say like, this has to work, and then one of them did work, so we got uh, methane production on lactate, and we know that methanogens cannot eat lactate in the absence of sulfate, so the system is working, right? We got growth and we got methane. We were happy, we were doing our thing, and then we sort of thought, wait a second, why did it just work only once, right? Uh, so there was the thought that maybe there's something special with this one case, so we took this co-culture that was working, isolated back the sulfate reducer, and we try to set the system up again. And in this case, when we did this, uh, every time we tried this with a isolate from the working co-culture, uh, we got a successful co-culture, right? So this strongly indicated that there was a mutation or something specific in that one working co-culture that made this entropy work. So there is potentially a mutant at our hands that is sort of syntrophic, and we want to understand this better, and it's quite, I find it very exciting. It, must, it might be just me, but this system is amazingly close to thermodynamic limits, right? So when you convert lactate and ferment it into acetate and hydrogen, that's your overall reaction, but actually the first step is lactate oxidation into pyruvate, which under standard condition is, is a positive delta G, right? So that reaction is not allowed uh, by the laws of physics under standard conditions, but this bug is somehow doing that uh, and then, by, then going through this step, it also produces acetate and hydrogen. Now, obviously, we're talking about standard conditions, and in the cell, the microenvironment might be quite different, but we thought that this syntrophic mutant uh, could potentially be linked to this initial step in the, in the metabolism. 
And uh, I guess it was beginner's luck. We just sort of uh, sequenced the, the syntrophic isolate that we have against the wild type. And lo and behold, we only found two mutations that were consistent across the set. So we have the isolates from the uh, sort of the original disulfibrial sulfate reducer culture versus the syntrophic isolates. And uh, they had two mutations, and one of them was on the lactate permease, and the other one was on this dehydrogenase, which is allowing this lactate oxidation to happen. And it turns out this dehydrogenase is, uh, is coupled to a, a trans, uh, antiporter, ion porter across the membrane. So that we hypothesize that maybe there's something happening here that the organism invests from the membrane potential that is facilitated by the ions uh, into, the, into making this reaction possible. And then once it gets going, it can produce hydrogen which then allows the metanogen to feed on and grow and you get the syntrophy working. Okay, so uh, the other interesting thing about this is that when we looked at the wild type version, so this sort of non-syntrophic version of this, uh, few of the clones there were actually polymorphic in this loci. So this is interesting because, so this wasn't a mutant, this was a, a, a polymorphism in the culture. Uh, is what this suggests, and then the question is, how is that polymorphism maintained? But I think the bottom line here, what I'm trying to get at, is that the thermodynamic limitation seems to be driving the evolution of the genotypes for this for this bug, right? And and the polymorphism is interesting, is because uh, this either suggests that there is maybe internal syntrophy between different genotypes, or perhaps. Uh, the, the population just maintains a certain amount of um, syntrophic genotypes just in case sulfate runs out and they're ready to create a syntrophic interaction with metanogens. Uh, so the, the second idea is quite interesting. So we want to, we're trying to go in that direction. This is now our recent work where we're trying to do these things. It takes time because these anaerobic systems are notorious to grow. But we also extended the system at the same time, so we introduced another metanogen that can grow on acetate, uh, such that we have sort of a full set here of syntrophic interactions. Uh, so we have the hydrogen-based interaction, but now we have also the acetate-based interaction. And this behaves as you expect in the absence of sulfate. Methane production increases in the three culture compared to the two cultures. But where we want to go with this is the maintenance of these syntrophic interactions in the absence of, sul sorry, in the presence of sulfate, right? Because for these communities, sulfate must be coming in and going out, and this, this interaction is so central to the whole community uh, that it's quite interesting to try to understand that question. The interaction is important to the community because if this is not working properly, uh, acetate accumulates in the system, acidifies things, and the whole thing collapses. And that's a common problem for these bioreactors that you have a 10 ton reactor and then suddenly it doesn't produce methane, it just does something, etc. So we want to understand the sort of robustness around sulfate, and that's what we've been trying to do set these uh, co cultures versus the tree culture, and then we try to sort of maintain them in the lab over multiple subculturings. Uh, each subculturing being three weeks. Um, and uh, as you can see here, if I now introduce sulfate at a level that is enough to respire all of that lactate, uh, we, 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 we start to lose the metanogens. So, the, so the, 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 the community breaks down. Um, but interest, and then if you have no sulfate, obviously the community stays. It's the only way for them to exist is to do syntrophy. Uh, but in the, in the middle, uh, levels of sulfate, so this is now stoichiometrically half of the sulfate that you need to respire all of the lactate, uh, you, you still see some maintenance. So the metanogens can be sustained in the system uh, when this is happening, uh, but interestingly, only the hydrogen-based metanogenesis can be sustained, and the acetate-based uh, syntrophy uh, is not able to sustain itself. We don't understand all that is going on here, there is a very good increase in methane production in the absence of sulfate that we don't see in the absence in the presence of half sulfate. We're trying to understand that currently. Okay, so hopefully 
what we are trying to do is make, make sense. So we try to bridge these two ends. We, you know, we want to look at the natural communities, try to understand the different functions that are there, how the system changes. But at the same time, we want to also bring those insights in, or merge them with the sort of insights we're trying to get from these minimal systems. And then we get carried away and we, we say, OK, now that we're getting some insights, can we use those also actually to go back and try to engineer actually new systems, right? And when I say engineer, what I mean is just, just putting together ecosystems, right? Can I sort of set the environment? Can I pick the species, put them together, and it sort of works? And now I'm running out of time, so I will not be able to tell you too much about it. But the sort of the general idea is you know, we can create these different interactions and maybe understand them and then maybe put them together to create more complex systems and always with a certain function in mind. So with the AD system, what we are trying to do is to extend now this core syntrophies with uh, primary, for, uh, primary degraders to then degrade uh, a higher sugar and we're aiming for cellulose and this might then be studied on its own but it could also be optimized uh, maybe genetically engineered, et cetera. Uh, but also, we take the approach to other systems that are not necessarily anaerobic. Uh, so one, one system that we are quite keen on is this sort of idea of closed ecosystem. Uh, can we do a microbial version of this um, using a phototroph uh, like the one I showed in the beginning? And we've made some, some progress with this where we try to use heterotrophs actually initially to create a mineral cycle working on manganese, which we know is crucial for maintaining phototrophs because they use manganese only uh, in their light harvesting systems. So we've been trying to set that, uh, that kind of uh, mineral cycling with two species that we know can oxidize and reduce manganese. Uh, and we've been trying to set that up. We first try to create a common media. So we run a lot of physiology experiments on these two guys. And it turns out that actually uh, they do can cross feed. Uh, so these are Chauvenella, Chauvenella onoidensis and Roseobacter ASWK. Uh, it's a marine organism, and this is a freshwater organism. And it turns out that Chauvenella grows on lactate uh, and overflows acetate, which uh, Roseobacter can use. And we, we are able to sort of measure all these things and show that uh, it works. And then. From there, we can go and look into the uh, manganese. So if I have just two slides here, the other system, just to briefly mention it, is a, is a system where we, we want to sort of create a microbial system that can support plant uh, on a media that normally doesn't support plant. And for this, we are using a mycorrhizal fungi that is shown to colonize plants and, and um, support them. And it turns out this, this, this fungi is oxotrophic for thiamine, which can be provided by uh, Bacillus subtilis. So without thiamine, this guy cannot grow. Uh, but with Bacillus subtilis, it can. And we can quantify this using time-lapse microscopy. But the latest thing we are finding here, which probably might be interesting to some, is that if we, if we try to create, so the system works if we spatially separate them on a plate. But if we premix them, uh, it doesn't work. So somehow they're inhibiting each other, and their inhibition is, is, is dependent on space or time. So if we also temporally separate them, that still works. But if we don't temporally or spatially separate them, it doesn't work. And we don't know why at the moment. But we, we think it's either oxygen depletion or, or pH. But yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. And I apologize for running late a bit. Uh, but this is what we are trying to do, sort of try to learn some of the ecological principles as well as the limitations that drive, that shape these communities and then try to use those insights to build uh, functional systems. Um, and with that, I'll acknowledge the people. Uh, the, the, the reactor work I mentioned is a, a sort of a public facing project, so all the data is on the web. Uh, so we put the data on the web as it becomes available. Uh, and we are very open to collaborate with people if you're interested. Um, I mentioned the, the workshop we did, and uh, obviously I thank everybody in the group. Uh, Andrea has a poster if you're interested on these uh, functionality analysis, and I acknowledge the collaborators um, and, and, and your time. Thank you.